I was just hoping to share my story of hope um, for others and to hopefully be able to help them um, with being able to share their stories of hope. Um, we, we're going to interview some people for um, their, their journeys through recovery and addiction and their battles with mental and physical ailments. Today's a special show, and it's dedicated to my cousin Johnny Beckham. He was murdered on June 29, 2021, and his murderer is still at large. Um, his murder, um, oh, we'll get into that later, but our special guest today is Johnny Beckham's sister, Mary Beckham. Um, I just want to say welcome to Mary Beckham my niece, and she's going to um, be talking today about the case. As you know, Mary has been an advocate for Johnny. She's very outspoken uh, regarding his murder and also bringing justice to Johnny Beckham. If you want to find, um, if you want to find his Facebook page, it's Justice, to, Justice for Johnny Beckham, B-E-C-K-H-A-M. Welcome, Mary. Hi, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm excited to get the word out and let, you know, let Johnny's story be heard. Awesome. Great. Thanks for coming, Mary. Can you tell us a little bit about Johnny's life? Of course, yeah. Um, him and my brother, Matt, well, actually, most of my family was born in Riverside. Uh, and him and him and Matt were out there, and my brother, Cody, was born later. But um, all my whole family, so my aunt, my dad, um, were all really taken care of. Johnny and his grandma and grandpa, obviously, but grandpa was, uh, you know, struggled. He struggled with violence and addiction. So eventually my dad ended up taking him and all my brothers out to a small town in Arizona called Parker, Arizona. Um, and so Johnny was about five when that happened. So it really, it really affected him. Right. Yes. Um, I remember those times because I was in that household, and it was really like a household of um, a close-knit family, but a very dysfunctional family, and as everyone out there probably, who, who everyone who has been touched by addiction, who's lived in a household like that, they know that that person, like oftentimes the sickest person in the household is the one who's controlling the household and ruling over the household. So my dad was addicted to meth, um, and he kind of was the, he was abusive and violent, and Jody being the brother, the big brother of the family of three sisters, and he have, having two little boys, um, he had to kind of escape with our mother to protect her. However, the unfortunate part, of course, is the children are the victims because, you know, they suffer the childhood trauma, and we're going to have uh, somebody on next week talking about childhood trauma. We're going to have a counselor on next week to discuss that topic a little bit more in detail, but... Yeah, that's a good background of Johnny's childhood and unfortunate things that happen when you're you, when you're living in a household where there's drugs and there's abuse. And so um, thank you um, for that, Mary. Can you go on to tell us a little bit more about what happened later in his life? Yeah, no, I can't even imagine how, how much that affected him. Um, and, I mean, like he had cousins his age that he grew up with, and, you know, he just kind of got pulled away from them all, but... Uh, when he was 18, him and my cousin Jesse and a couple of their friends, they went on a road trip, and they ended up getting in a really bad car accident. Uh, I think the tow yard told them that they're really surprised that they even survived. It was it was really bad. So Johnny ended up hurting his back pretty bad, and the doctor in town, I guess, I guess, uh, this was when Oxy really wasn't regulated, and so he prescribed him Oxy along with the other guys that were in that car. And it, um, you know, it got the best of him, and he ended up getting addicted to it. Um, when you say Oxy, are you talking about Oxycodone? oxycodone? Yes, I am. Okay, and um, that's a good point. It wasn't really regulated back then, and, and a lot of people... Uh, young people fell victim to that, and that's why we have the epidemic, I believe, in this country that we have now. Um, and then later on, at some point, well, not at some point, in 2008, our family suffered another tragedy. Right, yeah, Johnny was about 21 when this happened. Um, it was June 20, or 2008, and my dad passed away. He got in an accident out in the desert. Um, it was a motor, motor vehicle accident. Uh, and that really affected him because my dad was his sole provider, you know, since he was born. Uh, my mom 
my mom came into the picture a little later. But, um, yeah, so I just, I know that really affected him. I remember one time I was at a party, uh, at a, like a family party. I was 14 and I was up on the hill that he was living on because he, he lived separately at 21. He was on his own. Uh, and I was walking up to meet him, but he was walking down to meet me and I, he just, he was bawling and he hugged me and just cried on my shoulders. Like it's just, he's such a, he has such a big heart, you know? So he knows what it's like to be alone. So he's always been very friendly and he would be the first one to introduce himself to an unfamiliar face. You know, he was very, very kind. At his wake, I remember um, a lot of people mentioning that Johnny was their best friend, that he said, hey, you're my best friend. And yeah, I just thought that was funny how many people went up there and said that Johnny said that they were his best friend. (laughs) Right. They always just felt so special. You know, (laughs) he made everybody feel like they're the only one. Yep. That's right. Yeah. And I remember somebody writing on his uh, Facebook page, um, his Justice for Johnny page, um, that he was a legend in the town, you know, that he was kind of like a legend in the town because he was so smart and so sweet and he would do anything for anyone and, and help people work on their cars and he was talented in multiple things like working on cars, welding, um, he would do drawings and tattoo, he had a little shop for a while doing tattoos and there were multiple people at his funeral who stood up when uh, his sister said, has anybody ever gotten a tattoo from Johnny? I was and, one of them. And Alyssa was one of them, mm-hmm. yeah, so... Um, it, the tattoo wasn't the, wasn't that great, but I, I got one, and I'm glad I did. <laughs> but Mama didn't want her to get one, but she went ahead and did it. But anyway, she was grown, so what can you do? I actually think the tattoo's cute. I like it. It's, I like it. it's just the person that I got it with. I wish I didn't. Right, right. <laughs> well, you were young. We all make mistakes when we're young. But Johnny did a great job on the tattoo. Um, so then later on in his life, he met a girl and had a little boy, um, Bobby, Bobby J. Beautiful boy, looks just like Johnny. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about what happened when he was getting older, Mary, when he was about 24? Yeah. um, I mean, his addiction really got a hold of him. And at the time, I didn't know what it was, but it was something different. He, it was hard to be around him. He, um, you know, we'd be mid-conversation and we were really close, but we'd be, I'd be telling him something and he's just nodding off and. You know, it's really hard to see um, for a lot of our family. It was the, it was a very hard time for all of us. I remember seeing him like that uh, when he came out to visit California, just falling asleep. And it's really heart-wrenching because you know it's an addiction um, and they don't have a lot of control over it, but you want to, like, just say stop. Like, you, as a normie is what they call it in AA, a normie, meaning you don't have an addiction, you don't comprehend how hard that is and and you know just saying stop is not going to cut it you know but watching somebody self-destruct is so painful especially someone you love who has so much potential and so much talent and right and you know they don't want to be they don't want to be there they don't want to be doing that you know they want they want better for themselves and for their family and you know it it's just it's just hard unfortunately it runs in families too i believe um the gene it runs in families because in our family especially i feel like we can attest to that there's so many of us there's and it's, so many it's sad it's just, it's just sad yeah there's so many and it just feels like we don't have a lot of other issues in our families as far as like health issues but it's the addiction issue and the mental health issues that get a hold of the beckham family and it's unfortunate right it's it's terrible and and i'm sure there's lots of people listening who can relate that's another reason why we wanted to do this show is to um, n- let people know that they're not alone, even if we can reach one person and let them know, hey, you're not alone. Right, and you there's know. no, right, trying to break that stigma against us, um, against people like us, people who are addicts and alcoholics. Right, and, right. Al- and finding mm-hmm. that there is a gene and finding that there, there it could be a disease and they're, they're saying it's a disease. And, you know, I believe it's a disease. There's others that don't, but I, I don't see how it could not be. Right. Sorry, Mary, did I cut you off? No, you're fine. I was just going to say that, like, the way people see, you know, people who struggle with drug addictions, you know, it's just, it's so, it's bizarre. Like, I mean, 
they just see him as like a horrible person. I remember one time when I was 21, uh, I would go out to the bars in my hometown, Parker. And I mean, on the weekends, and I would just, I would go out there and uh, hang out. But there was always this sheriff at this one bar called Roadrunner. There was always this sheriff that would, he was in uniform and he's just hanging out at the bar, like just standing around. And so one day I was probably drunk and I'm just hanging out and talking to everybody. And I ended up talking to him. And I remember something he told me. He said, I'm going to get your brother one day. And I was like, what? Wow. Um, it just caught me off guard because he, my brother is just such a kind person. Yep. Like, he would do anything for anybody. He minded his own business. I don't understand, you know, how somebody could have a vendetta against somebody just because they struggle with something. You know what I mean? Right. And yeah. at that, he, he didn't have a record. He he right. never been arrested. Right. Yeah. yeah. Johnny, yeah, that's. You know, that town, my mom had told me that, you know, you know, that grandma was really close with, with Johnny, and, um, you know, that was the hard part, you know, how close grandma was with Johnny, um, was hard for her, you know, with grandpa being an addict, and now Johnny, and then, And she passed you know, a month before he did. Yeah, she passed a, a month exactly before he was shot, you know, he passed the next day, but, um, I remember I was coming home from Havasu, um, from her doctor's appointment, she had lung cancer, and I was driving home, and I was high on Highway 95, and I had two trucks that were, um, one behind me and one in front of me, so I was in the middle, and I had my granddaughter with me, so I was, I was driving slow, which, um, you know, I was kind of just cruising, I didn't have a choice, and I get down to the bottom of the hill, and I'm thinking, well, where's, where do I turn, and then I, rem I remembered, like, oh, I gotta go left, so I got into the left lane kind of quick, not real quick, but kind of quick, and when I got into that lane, um, a vehicle came from the side and got behind me. I didn't think much of it. It's really dark out in Parker. There's not a lot of uh, lights out there. I couldn't tell that it was a cop or a sheriff, but it was. So I turn left, and then I'm trying to remember where Mom's Street is, and I'm like, okay, it's not that one. So I slowed down right near a bar, you know, which may have made, made me look suspicious. I don't know. But then I turned right into the first street where Mom's Street was, um, and all of a sudden I got lit up by the sheriff, and he gets out, and he tells me, um, and I was speeding. And I said, uh, when was I? S I said, no, I wasn't speeding. And he said, oh, yeah, up on Highway 95. Mm -hmm. And he gave me the coordinates of where I was supposedly mm -hmm. speeding. He had the coordinates memorized, apparently. And I was like, well, I was between two big rigs. I wasn't speeding, officer. And he was like, oh, yes, yes, you were. You, all you need to do is go online and just pay the ticket. Here's the online thing. You just need to pay. And I was like, I'm not going to pay for a ticket when I wasn't speeding. And he was, like, adamant that I needed to pay this ticket. And... I took it and I went back to mom's house and I got in there and it was like the first time I'd been alone there, you know, because mom was staying the night at the hospital and I was with my granddaughter and I heard boom, boom, boom on the door and it scared me. I jumped and I thought, oh, this officer who just lied about me speeding is now at the door and I didn't want to answer it. And then I finally just said, who is it? And he said, it's Johnny. And he started laughing like it's Johnny. And I was like, oh, so I opened the door and Johnny comes in and I tell him the story, you know, like, oh, I just got pulled over. You know, this is what the cop said, and he said to me, is it this cop? Is it this sheriff? And I was like, that sounds like that could be the name. Let me get the ticket. And he pulls a um, card out of his back pocket, had a sh sheriff's name on it. I pull out my ticket. It's the same name. And he's like, oh, yeah, he pulls me over all the time. He constantly is pulling me over, uh, searching my car. Last time he pulled me over, he um, searched my car and went into my trunk and broke it. He, like, used some kind of crowbar to pop his trunk open and Johnny was telling him no no there's a there's a trick to it because my truck trunk is broke let me help you and he wouldn't let him you know help him and there's a Johnny showed me there's even a video he had of the officer like after he broke the trunk he was telling him hey you, you guys broke my trunk this and that and they were just leaving and they just ignored him and left so um, I remember seeing that video he posted it on Facebook he went live and I remember seeing and it's just I can't imagine dealing with that every time you get in your vehicle to drive you have to be terrified that somebody's gonna you know what I mean yeah it's, it was a lot it's a lot that they, they were really just kind of after him and that you know it's unfortunate and grandma brought that up to me too like hey and it stayed in the back of my mind that the cops were after him you know and he had to live with that um just a little transitioning can you tell us uh, about what happened the night of 
June 29th, and from your perspective, um, when you got a phone call in the middle of the night regarding your brother? Yeah, um, it was around 9 or 10. I'm not exactly, I have to look at the time, but I was at home, and my AC had just went out in my house. So we were, we got these um, portable conditioners and I, we were setting it up and I got a call from my sister, Miranda, and she said, our brother Johnny was shot. And I was like, oh my goodness, you know, like, I I didn't think it was, for some reason, I don't even know why at that point I, I was. But I didn't think it was serious, and then I, mean, I, I knew. Sorry it was to cut you off. I remember thinking the same thing. I said it to my mom. I literally said to her, um, "She was like Johnny's been shot," and I was like, "He's fine." I was. I remember right. just saying that, and my and my mom was like, "No, he well." I was like, "Where was he shot?" And she said, "In his leg." And I was like, "Oh, he's gonna be okay." And she's like, "No, I'm going out there." And I was like, "Mom, you don't need to go out there. He's gonna be okay." I really didn't think you know anything was gonna happen. I thought he was gonna be fine. I remember yeah. saying just that. Yeah. Exactly. I thought the same exact thing, too. I was like, and then Miranda, I, my sister, even thought the same thing because we were making plans to bring him back. She's like, okay, well, they're going to take him in the helicopter. Um, but So she said, I'm going to go back a little bit, that he got shot in the leg, that they, that they said it was self-inflicted, but there was no gun around. I mean... If you're going to shoot yourself, you know, you're not going to run back inside to put the gun away. Um, and then the next door neighbor's door was open and uh, his dog ran out. So this is what she told me. And I was like, oh, my gosh, what the hit? And then and then she said that uh, they're going to fly him out here because I live in El Mirage now in, like, Phoenix area, uh, about three hours away from Parker. So she said they're going to fly him out there. And then she's in Parker, so she said, I'm going to come out there, but will you go be with him? And I was like, of course. And so uh, she said, and I'll drive him back after. And I was like, okay. Um, So I get ready to do all that. And uh, about, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes later, she calls me and says, oh, never mind, they're going to take him to Havasu, which is about 45 minutes away from Parker and she said it was more severe than they thought it would be um so then at that point I knew that I had to call my aunt and let everybody know what was going on yeah um I that night um it was literally just two days after we buried grandma um and I in my mind I was like okay going to even going to bed that night I remember thinking okay I can finally, um, I I remember thinking I can finally relax a little bit um, because now mom is gone and the funeral's over. Before this, she was on hospice for three weeks. So it was like this really uptight time in the lives of myself and my siblings, my sisters. And we were finally able, I was thinking we can finally relax. And then at midnight, I get woke up from my daughter saying, um, you need to call um, you need to call Aunt Tammy, or Aunt Tammy wants you to call 911, is what she said. And I hmm. thought, no, I need to call, and I said to her, no, I need to call 911, um, or I need to call her. I'm sorry, I, need, I don't need to call 911. I need to call Aunt Tammy. It's an emergency. And she's like, no, no, you need to call 911. And I remember thinking, okay. Then I, then I got a gut-wrenching feeling that something was definitely wrong, so I called my sister, and she let me know. But I never realized how severe it was. I knew that he was shot in the leg. Um, I knew that they had said it was self-inflicted and there was no gun, which really concerned me because in the back of my mind, I still had that my mom's voice saying, the police don't like Johnny. You know, the police don't like Johnny. And then I remember hearing someone say Miranda had said they didn't spend a, a, a very much time at the crime scene. And I just, in my own right. head, I was like, I need to go. But they were saying Johnny's in the, the OR in Havasu. And so... Um, I think I heard 50% chance or, or more, and I thought, yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that was uh, what happened, but there's a couple other things that in between that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I thought that that's what I had heard. So, And then when t- after talking to Alyssa, and she kind of reassured me, it's in the lake, he's, he's young, he's going to be okay. I took off out there, but in my mind, I'm not going to the hospital. I'm going to Johnny's house, and I'm taking pictures of the crime scene. This is what mm-hmm. I'm going to do because I'm not comfortable 
Um, some people in the family thought I was like out of my mind crazy. You just had a bad feeling. We all had a bad feeling. I did have that bad feeling. And so, you know, even though some people thought I was crazy and were, and were worried about me going there, obviously, which makes sense, right? Um, I went ahead and went on to the crime scene and took pictures. And what I seen when I got there was kind of surprising, um, shocking, because there was a towel left behind. Blood uh, all over it. Covered in blood. Um, blood still all over the ground. Um, Johnny's pencils that he always carried in his shirt pocket that he used to, you know, he would draw, he would write poetry. Johnny was just very creative. Were on the ground. Um, cigarette butts on the ground, um, several cigarette butts, two water bottles. I mean, I collected it all, and I took lots of pictures. Right, um, and it was empty there, too, and you got there, I mean, it I got there at 3 a.m. Yeah, I got there at 3 a.m., and um, it was very eerie because it was almost like a rainy night, too. It was kind of creepy. It did. It started to rain. It started to rain after on the way home from the hospital. And you started to take, when you started, you said you started to take the pictures, and it started raining, and you were glad, or right after, and you were glad you got the pictures. No, I was glad I got the pictures because on the way home from the hospital after Johnny passed, it started to rain, oh. and I thought, well, now it's raining on the crime scene, so, you know, there it is, but whatever. Right. And regardless, those <sighs> pictures really came in to be helpful. Right, no no other pictures pictures were taken by the police anyway. Nothing, so nothing. Um, evidence wasn't taken. There was nothing taken. Right. Well, we don't know exactly what was taken, but I don't believe there were any other pictures of the crime scene from what I've heard. But anyhow, so that was my portion that I wanted to get in there, you know, that... You know, that was my portion of the story as far as going there. What about, right. um, Mary, Where want to pick up where you left off? Yeah, sorry. Um, no, no worries. So they flew him out there in the helicopter 45 minutes away, and within that 45 minutes, he flatlined um, in, in the helicopter. Um, I don't remember, I don't know exactly when this happened, but he lost five liters of blood and... Um, while I was on my way out there, my sister told me that he's in the OR, OR and the surgeons are trying to save his life. Um, and then a little bit after that, she told me that his pulse is back and he has a 50% chance. I believe that's when she said she, it was a 50% chance. And I was like, okay, okay, he'll be okay. And, you know, I was very hopeful. And then the closer I got, um, I got another message from her saying that there is a 5% chance that that he'll make it. Okay. So then I uh, I get to the hospital, and he's in the ICU, and uh, he has a ventilator, right? Um, his eyes are closed, but they're swollen. He has a major cut, like, on his chest, all the way down to his stomach. They ended up having to take him back into the OR to make sure that there was no internal bleeding. Um, and after that happened, they weren't able to stop the bleeding, uh, the external bleeding. So when I went in there, it was, it was probably the hardest thing I've ever seen but um the nurse there was the nurse in there the whole time applying pressure to his wound the whole time we were there walking in and out they flew in blood just for him just to keep him safe while there um until we could all say goodbye and by the time we were leaving he just progressively got worse and we were I mean, we were there a couple hours. Right. So. Right, and another reason, um, the police said that there was two gunshot wounds, right? And so when they went and they, they saw that it, if it had just been the one gunshot wound to the to the thigh that they had seen, um, I, I thought that they weren't going to open him up otherwise, but then they did because of they thought that there was two, but there ended up not being two. Um. When um, when I got there, that's what the nurse told me. The nurse did say um, the reason that we cut him like, because I asked, I said that you know it looked. I've never seen any cut like that. It was hideous. I'm not gonna lie. They they it looked like he they ripped his chest open. But I guess that's what they do. They they break the, the bones and they they have to cut straight down. But what she said was that because that they were told by the police officers there were multiple 
um, bullets that they were looking in there to see if he had internal bleeding inside. And also, how do you self-inflict two gunshot wounds into mm -hmm. your leg? With, yeah, well... I'm sorry, just... But then the nurse did also say to me that from what they witnessed, from what they saw, um, it looked like the one bullet was an exploding bullet. They said it, it, it was. They didn't say it looked like. They said it was an exploding bullet, and it went upward. So it exploded and went upward, and so there was a lot of shrapnel inside of him. So that's what also why they cut him open. They had to... Apparently, you know, he's, according to the nurse, they said he was stable, and then they cut him open. They said that they were they put, like, 13 clamps on the femoral artery, and then they went inside because he was... Um, they don't, she was kind of confused by it. She said that she didn't think he was stable, but um, there, there, she's not the doctor. The doctor obviously cut him open for a reason, and he obviously wasn't stable, right. or she wouldn't have cut him open. They, he would not have cut him open if he was stable. That's right. my opinion of it. But, yeah, I saw the same kind of scene, and it was really, it was really surreal and horrible. Um, I was in there with Matthew, uh, my oldest nephew, and Johnny's oldest brother, and Cody, and they were standing on either side of me, and on the way in, I saw your mom in the parking lot, Mary, mm -hmm. and she, she warned me. She tried to warn me, but in my head, I wasn't, like, comprehending it because I still had this idea he was going to be fine, you know, and she tried to say, she said literally, right. like... You didn't have uh, service the whole way out there, so while I was texting you the update, yeah, you walked in thinking he was... I thought he was going to be okay, and, and I walk in, and, but, but getting, seeing your mom in the parking lot, she did try to warn me. She did say... And I don't know if she's trying to warn me or if she was just, like, in shock herself, but she said they're just holding him together so that the family can make it. And I'm like, I didn't understand her. And in my head, I was like, she, she's wrong. Like, she's so wrong. That's not – no, he's going to be fine. So walking into that, it was really shocking, and it was exactly what you said. But in my mind, I didn't comprehend he was on a ventilator, and I saw his chest rising up and down, and I thought, he's breathing pretty good. That's so, what I thought, too. Yeah, I so – same it, thing. Yeah. We, by me. Yeah, until the nurse, like, said to me, hey, um, the faster we put blood into him, the faster it's coming out, and mm -hmm. we're just holding him. They were literally holding him together. In my life, I've never seen something or heard of something like that, and it was very, I fell to my knees. It was bad. You could smell blood in the room. They were running bags of Oneg in, you know. It was pretty bad. It was horrible. I, uh, I smelled that smell once since then, and I don't think I'll ever forget that smell I was at Walmart in the pharmacy aisle and it was just absolutely it was crazy to smell like and then for some reason I can't get this beautiful curly hair out of my head like full head of curls it was so beautiful yeah his mom took a locket and I thought that was really sweet I actually thought about asking for a locket but then I felt like it was a selfish thing so I didn't ask but when we were there um Aww. At the corner, um, Doris got a locket of his hair, and he did have beautiful curly hair. Um, I love do you want to tell us a little bit, um, a little bit about what happened next um, while we were waiting in the waiting room? Yeah, well, I mean, the whole time I was there, I was kind of already in investigation mode. I was like, "Who did this? We need to figure out what's going on," because I was scared that them saying it was self-inflicted and there wasn't a gun. I also heard that they didn't stay out there for too long. I know that they didn't tape off the scene. Like, just all this stuff made me very anxious. And also knowing, you know, that when I was 21, there was a sheriff who was adamant on getting my brother, right? So, sorry. So, okay. um, so I was messaging my friends and that live in Parker still. Um, and I was like, and she, I mean, this is a small town, so everybody talks, everybody knows what's going on. She already knew that he was shot. She knew, you know, what was happening. But I was asking her to find out information because a lot of people will come to her for information or, um, you know, and she, she'll let me know. And I, she has more connections. She talks to more people than I do, so... Somebody had already messaged her, and uh, it was actually the neighbor that's across the street. Um, and he said that he knows who it is, and, you know, he has, uh, he's positive it's this person. So I, um, I ended up getting in a group chat with him, and he said that it's this man named Theron. 
and Theron's also in the drug scene, and um, he grew up out in Parker as well. So I was I was talking to him a little bit, and then uh, later on, I went back into the waiting room and I told my family that I'm hearing that you know it's Theron, and then one of Johnny's friends uh, say that Johnny said it was the quiet one. And I didn't know who the quiet one is. I was like, did he hear it right? How was Johnny speaking? I was just very confused, but I kept it in my mind. And you should too, because it's going to come up. It's going to come up in the next episode, or next story time. Interesting. Um, go ahead, Emerson. I was just going to say, um, the person's name you were saying, uh, was that uh, Theron with a T? Yeah, Theron, T-H-E-R-O-N. Okay, Theron, okay. Interesting. Okay, so that was the first, the first, um, the first suspect, or, or that was coming about. And why did people think it might be this person? Right. Um, he was. At, and what was that? Why did people think it might be Theron? Oh yeah. Okay. The sightseeing um, that they saw him. They saw him. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of people who were positive it was Theron, and I don't know if it was just from, you know, the couple of people who might have saw what happened. I just saw him, and then it just got around town. Um, but Theron is my brother's ex-girlfriend, ex-boyfriend. So uh, Theron and his girlfriend had broken up, and my brother started dating her. And they were together for a while. And I guess when my brother was out of town with his girlfriend, uh, Theron went and broke in to my brother's house and stole stuff. So my brother ended up calling him out on Facebook and saying, like, hey, this is the guy who broke into my house. Like, just be aware, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of people thought it was Theron. Yeah, I remember that being in the uh, waiting room and hearing that name and having Alyssa start looking up. Well, I remember seeing that on Facebook when he posted it and saying, this is the guy. I'm not one to call the cops myself because right. can get cops involved because, you know, the snitches get stitches policy was his thing. But, you know, um, so he po but he did share it on Facebook and say, hey, this is what he stole. He stole my son's Christmas presents, um, his football. He stole all of my electronics. Um, him and his girlfriend, they broke into my house and stole it while, you know, while he was gone. Yeah, I remember that, too. And then I think I had you looking it up while I was at the hospital. I did. I looked up a lot of different things. I ended up um, finding a lot of information about Theron, um, all his arrest records, and just th there was a lot of them. There was, like, 70 um, arrest records and a lot of different reasons why. Yeah, so there was, yeah. But, yeah, we all went into, like, an investigated um, mode. mode because yeah. nobody else seemed like they were. Right, mm. right. Well, it was a hard time. I mean, people were grieving. Everybody grieves differently. I mean, you, right. you well, know. Sorry, go ahead, Mary. No, I think, too, just meant as far as the police, because it, it was terrifying to know what we knew, you know. And, um, yeah, so I, I, I think the family, yeah, exactly, grieves different ways. I think that was my way and your guys' way of, Coping. you know, we can't grieve until we can get justice or we know what's going on right, right. exactly um, okay so then um, after that um, I mean we had a decision to make as a family we had a decision to make and I remember um, the doctors and nurses asking like what do we want to do and um, you know uh, Matthew taking the lead as the um, oldest brother in the family and you know, making a decision that we had to take Johnny off life support. Um, they were holding him on. They were holding it on onto his thigh on pressure. He was on. so pale, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and uh, yeah, we knew. And, and, and watching the doctors bring in blood um, and knowing that they were exhausting their blood supply, um, it really bothered me, and I think it bothered Matthew as well. Um, Miranda as well. And I think we all discussed it. We kind of discussed it, and then... They had, I believe it was about, what, 10, 15 when they finally... Um, it was 9.55 when... Thanks, honey. I, don't, uh, I can barely remember. Okay. It was 9.55 yeah. when they, they took him off life support. And right. 
and then um, we left the hospital and started driving and it started to rain and then I think you got a phone call is that right uh, I think it was a text message okay. it might have been a phone call but yeah my um, we were driving separate vehicles and it started raining um, and we were on the phone when I think Miranda texted me okay uh, my sister and she said that the medical examiner said that um, the officer who originally showed up at the scene um, that he was he wasn't really being the sheriff. compliant the sheriff. cooperative and uh, oh yeah it was a sheriff um, he wasn't being cooperative and she was trying to get some information the medical examiner and the sheriff said um, it's two hours past my shift uh, something along the lines of basically he's not going to deal with it because he's off work. And I remember you saying like that she said he was definitely um, like borderline uncooperative. They were like really upset. Like why would the, I felt like there was a question in the air of like why would the detective not want to talk to the medical examiner, you know, about this case? I mean, somebody just passed away, a 33-year-old boy, father of, uh, you know, a 9-year-old boy is, is gone. Why wouldn't you want to tell the uh, medical examiner what you know? You were the person who was on the scene. I mean, who knows more than the person that he showed up? He's the one who showed up. He's the one who told the hospital staff that there was multiple gunshots. I mean, of course the medical examiner is going to want to know, like, what did you see? You know, that's his job. But I guess it was just, you know, I don't know. He just didn't want to deal with it at the time. And there were things that other officers had said about Johnny after, after he passed. Um... Well, we'll talk about that in the next the next episode. Um, oh, but yeah, yeah. Um, we might be able to get to it. Yeah. So at this point, you know, we're hearing this kind of stuff, and we're driving. You and I, our thought process. I believe we were on the phone together, and our thought process was to go to Johnny's house and see what we could see. Or were we? I, I'm, can you refresh my memory, Mary? Were we? Did we already decide to meet with um, the neighbor at that point? Is that why we were heading to Johnny's? Uh, we might have we might have decided on the way while we were in separate vehicles, but I know we showed up at Johnny's house um, in the same vehicle, and I was messaging the neighbor from across the street, asking him, you know, what he saw, and then asking if he'd like to meet up with us so we can kind of discuss what happened and what he did see. Uh, so yeah, we did. We went to Johnny's house. He met us there. Um, and he said that uh, he basically said the same thing my sister told me about the door and the dog, like the next door neighbor's door was open and his dog ran out. He also told me that it was, they said it was self-inflicted. Um, and he was saying that he was positive it was Theron. Uh, also, it was self-inflicted again. There was no gun. Uh, He said it was positive it was Theron, and he watched Theron walk by his his own house, uh, the neighbor's house, and while he was on the phone with 911, he saw Theron walk by, and Theron was pulling a gun out of his pocket. Um, He was the first one to call 911, and while he was on the phone with 911, he heard somebody yell after the gunshot, don't cuss. Don't cuss. It. Don't cuss. Okay. <laughs> he said, F word. Look what you made me do, or you made me do this, or something along the lines with that. That's uh, right. Um, one thing to note, I think, is that the neighbor across the street originally, when when um, he, he described Theron, he described him because he didn't know his name. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Sorry. Um, he was talking to somebody about. Uh, what he looked like, what the guy looked like, and this person sent him a photo of what he looked like uh, or what Darren looked like, and he's like, yeah, that's that's for sure him. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. So he didn't know Theron personally, but he's now saying positively this is him after seeing a picture of him. Exactly, Mm -hmm. exactly. (coughs) And uh, he also informed us that uh, the sheriff, that same sheriff, uh, was first on scene and 
uh, he didn't do anything for the first, he said like 10 minutes that he was just walking around. I remember him saying uh, that. Across the street and looking at like mailboxes and stuff. And there was a mailbox down across the street. Um, and he mentioned like that he was looking at that mailbox that was down. And I said, well, did, did somebody crash into that mailbox recently? And he said, that's been down for a long time. He's like, but there he is like just roaming around looking at mailboxes and stuff. Right. And right, which, why? I mean, you're not even assisting right. a gunshot. And I think know. that was one of our questions. Our first questions was like, well, what about applying pressure to the wound? Because Johnny was hit in the femoral artery. He was bleeding profusely, you know, and yeah. and he indicated nope. And he said, I think he said that he was going to go try to go over to Johnny, and the sheriff would not allow him to, and this upset him. He did him. say that. Yeah, and he said that he, he tried to, t to tell him a story of some sort, about what he had heard, and the sheriff basically started to be like, got defensive and told him like, well, where did you hear that, and how do you know these things? But he didn't yeah. tell us, he didn't tell us exactly what that story was either. Right. If I remember right, does that sound about right? That, yeah, no, that sounds correct. Okay, well, um, so. There's also, um, I forgot to mention that when we were still in the hospital, Oh, I actually I did mention it, the quiet one. Never mind. I'm sorry about that. Oh, that's all right. Um, so then um, at this point, um, we we went down a trail with the neighbor because he thought that perhaps, he mentioned perhaps that Theron left on a dirt bike and he took us down into the canyon and we took a video of the canyon with dirt bike tracks. There was a dirt bike track going through the canyon. Do you remember that? I do, yes. So we did that, and then... Um, we were thinking maybe the weapon was thrown out somewhere over there. Right. We uh, tried to look for anything, but we did see a dirt bike track or some kind of tracks. The across the neighbor, um, the neighbor across the street, he actually did tell us that it seemed like the officers were... They did stay around for, for like an hour or so, um, walking up and down the street. He felt like they were there longer than what when we originally had heard, that they were only there for right. a short period of time. However, I still did find all that stuff at the scene, so that's disturbing. Um, do you want to talk about what you heard um, was said about Johnny um, um, by, by the officer? By this the, is what I was going to – this is what oh, I was okay, talking yeah, about. We yeah, had go heard, ahead. Yeah. Yeah, you guys should go ahead. Oh, um, just that, you know, we had heard um, – Later on, but after he had passed, yeah, after he had passed, we had heard that it was said to someone else um, that the um, sheriff that was on the scene said that Johnny was a piece of um, the S word, and that he um, that he was going to deem it self inflicted. Yeah, and he was glad. And he was he glad. glad that he was dead. Yeah, and mm -hmm. yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah, I remember being told that, and. Um, I mean, I can't even say that I was really surprised, to be honest. I was. Yeah, no. I don't know. I was. I mean, I was. Even though I, I, I know that there are, there are some good cops, there are some bad cops, but sometimes stuff like this shocks me. It's just sad. It's sad. Well, you want, I mean, we knew that they were kind of like mm, against him in some way or some, of, or some, at least we knew one was, but you, you mm -hmm. like to try to hope that, you know, even though you're skeptical and you're trying to do all these things, you're trying to do your own investigation because you're trying to be your own best advocate anyways, it still shocked me, you know, that they would actually, that someone would actually say that about someone else. I mean, and, and it just... No. It just I adds on to the layers of the things that, that have gone on in, in this case. Well, and it adds to the... It just makes you um, brutally aware of the stigma that's out there that towards too. addicts and towards people in general, yep. you know, people feeling superior right. over I, other people. It's mm -hmm. not right. I think that's why I wasn't too shocked is just because... I mean, I expect it from somebody who's going to let somebody bleed out for 10 minutes and not tend to them, right. you know, and who just thinks that because he has a problem with drugs that <laughs> he's just, you know, useless and doesn't deserve to live. Like, I just expect the worst from those kind of people, and I think that's why. Exactly. I think I'm not I'm not shocked um, I that he was – thinking it i guess but the fact that he said it to somebody else that's what shocks me no oh, yeah he openly yeah. admitted that to other people and that just that shocked me right well 
I think that there's kind of a code in that. Uh, yeah, I get that, it. Yeah. Yep. So I think that's kind of where that, that you know, they think they can say yep. whatever they want to one another because yeah, everyone got each knows what back. we mean. Because nobody's going to call them out. Yeah, there's a blue wall. Um, okay, so what about, um, we have a few more minutes. Do you want to go into, because we're going we're gonna to pick up on this story again on February 26th with Mary. Do you feel like you have, um, you can go into the sheriff's office um, when we went in there and we spoke with um, the uh, detective or Sheriff Poindexter? Do you want to go into that now or you want to hold off? Yeah, I think we should hold off on that. But I do want to mention that while we were at Johnny's, we found out that the next door neighbor that um, did leave his, or his door was wide open and his dog ran out. Um, we found out what his name was, and it was Brian, also known as the quiet one. Brian Dunnan. Oh. Brian Dunnan. Yeah, but that's not the name that was on the police report. <laughs> they had the wrong Brian. But we'll go into yeah. that in another time, that the police had the wrong Brian. Okay, and so next week we will um, have a um, lady named April Jones. She's going to be joining us to talk about childhood trauma, and she is going to... Um, she has a lot of things that she that she has uh, websites and things like that. So it's going to be an exciting time to talk about childhood trauma with April Jones. Also, I want to mention that in Riverside on February fifteenth, uh, that's a Tuesday at seven p.m. There's an organiza organization um, hosting an event, and the organization is called Kits with Kindness. And you can find them on kitswithkindness.org. And on Tuesday, they will be packing. Um, packing up um, packages for care kits. care kits, thank you, for people in need. And um, I've been blessed to have some of those in my car, so I have some for pets, I have some for people who need it, and there's water bottles, there's food. They have a need for some supplies right now. Um, I think it's some things like uh, cupcakes and different things, but you can call them um, and find out if you have the, if you have the, um, if you have the um, Items necessary. Yeah, if you have some items, I, I lost my word there. But if you have some, if you're if you want to donate some supplies, I guess is what I'm trying to say. You can call them at 951-522-0510. You can also look at them up on um, kidswithkindness.org, and you can also attend their event on Tuesday at 7 p.m. It is at um, the Cube Smart Storage at 4011 Fairground Street in Riverside, California, 92501. Um, and also, please, we we could use any um, tips you might have regarding the case for Johnny Beckham. Also, we would ask that you go on our Facebook page and check it out and follow us at Justice for Johnny Beckham. That's B-E-C-K-H-A-M, and it's Justice for Johnny Beckham. Also, we have our own Facebook page for Dying to Get Well, um, you can um, go on there, and we have a Twitter account, and, and an Instagram as well, and an Instagram, and we will have, and we'll put a, post a schedule of our upcoming shows, so you can see what we're going to be going over. Um, yeah, in the and next in month. a future episode, I'll be sharing my story. My mom will share her story. Um, what week are we going to be talking about the rest of Johnny's story? Uh, February twenty sixth for the rest of Johnny's story. So please do join us there. Uh, here on February 26th, same There's time. a lot more to it, a lot more layers, and it gets really dark. So I I also thought it might be nice if we maybe shared one of our favorite memories. Oh, that's a good idea. The, okay, sure. The favorite memory. Okay, I'll go first. Um, uh, right now? I mean, we have... If we have time. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I remember when we were young, um, we we were probably like seven... Uh, we were all hanging out. It was me, Mary, Miranda, Cody, um, Casey, and I think I think James, too, was there. All the cousins. All the cousins. And we were all, like, around six, seven. And the older cousins, Johnny and Maddie and Bobby and Scotty, they all thought it was funny to lock us in the bathroom. And so they threw us all in this little tiny bathroom together, and they put a little belt buckle around it and I tied it on that. there. Well, first they, they held it. I forgot. They held it, and we were trying to get out, and we were screaming, and we felt like we were suffocating in there because it's such a small bathroom. So we're sitting there <laughs> on the air vent on the floor trying to breathe in, just, you know, breathing on the floor. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> and we were literally, we took, we took turns breathing in the air vent. Like, we were, like, suffocating. 
there was a window there was a window but it was way up high and it was small and we had a hard time fitting and so or getting up there and so we were like how are we going to do this because it was so high up we were all so small and so then I remember at one point it was like they left us in there for like an hour at least and then we they acted like they left and then I guess they were really just watching tv in the living room well Johnny comes and knocks on the door and he's like hey and I, I opened it, and he opened it a little, and he's like, come on, come on, guys, you can, I'll let you out of here. And so we were like, oh, thank you, and we started trying to go out, and he, he started laughing, and we tried to open it, and it wouldn't open because he had tied it with a belt buckle and tied it on the doorknob onto the closet right across. So we thought we were going to get out. We tasted a little bit of freedom, and <laughs> that was it. We were oh. stuck in there, and they left us in there. That He actually left, and he was dying laughing. He thought it was the funniest thing. And it was like another hour or so, and we finally decided to all climb on each other's shoulders and backs and, and get out that window. <laughs> That's Where were so the parents? funny. I if wonder. anybody ever needs a babysitter, he would have been the one. <laughs> he, would just, Great. he would just lock them in the... Um, in the bathroom. Okay, so I'm just going to say, we'll, we'll give our memories of Johnny in the next episode because we got to go. Thanks for listening to KCAA at 102.3 FM, 1050 AM, and 106.5 FM. And this is Dying to Get Well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Mary. Bye, Mary. <laughs>